Amen. Hallelujah. So in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16, uh, we'll read from there tonight just for a moment. The Bible says, but the Lord said, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. Verse 16, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Let's pray. Dear Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you and worship you. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to be here tonight. Lord, we don't, count, we don't take that for granted, Lord. There's many people that can't make it to church anymore. And so, Father, we pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that number one, you'll keep us healthy enough to always be engaged with the people of God. And Lord, I pray, if, uh, Lord, for those that are even watching online tonight, Lord, because of one situation or another, I pray that, God, you would minister to them in a powerful way. But above all, Lord God, we pray for your presence to come in this place like it already is. We don't want it to stop now, Lord. The worship has been, Lord, honorable to you, Lord. It's been pleasing to you, Lord God. It's sweet incense to you. But tonight, we pray right now for the word to be anointed. Lord, I pray the people will not hear me. I pray they will hear you and you alone for your words, Father God, are, are truth and they're powerful and they're living. And I pray tonight, Father, we will grow in our, in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you've been coming on a Wednesday night for any length of time, you know that uh, Pastor Gary has been preaching some awesome messages. He's preaching some messages of real core truth, if you will. And it's been tremendous. If you're paying attention and listening and following along, it's been tremendous. And it's been, it's been liberating for people. And uh, I know it has been for me. Last Wednesday night, he preached a message that I think he entitled, God is looking for finishers. I don't know that to be a... He talked a lot about that. I'll just say that. I wrote that title down. So if he didn't title it that, that's what I did. So God is looking for finishers. He told the story of a Tanzanian marathon runner by the name of Joe, I mean, John Stephen Akwari. Did you remember the story he told? He was running injured in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. And, and I'm not going to re-preach uh, his sermon, but I just want to make a couple of points as it leads into the one that God's given to me tonight. The runner was finished. Uh, he finished the race hours behind the leaders due to his injuries. And then, as Pastor Gary said, when the media interviewed him after the race, because obviously he was not going to place, he's not going to, there's no glory to cross the finish line, you know, and last place or whatever to certain people because they think, well, you know, I can't, I'm not going to get the prize or the trophy or the money or the whatever. But they asked him, why did you finish or why did you stop running? Why didn't you finish? And his answer was a perfect answer. Should be the answer that we give to God all the time in our own personal life. Uh, it, obviously with different wordings, but the same purpose. He said, my country didn't send me thousands of miles to start the race. They sent me thousands of miles to finish the race, to finish the race. Well, I saw the video on that today, and uh, I watched it a little bit, and obviously not the whole 26 miles, but uh, I saw the finish line, and I saw him coming uh, across the, the, the finish line limping. He had had some bandages on his leg. I'm not sure exactly what the injury was. Pastor Gary went on to preach that message that night and included many challenges that the early church went through, which included times of suffering. He mentioned this scripture that I just read in uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 15 through 16. And as I read in 16, it says, I will show him who the apostle Paul, how much he must suffer for my namesake. Now, I want to ask you a question tonight, or I want to pose the question to the whole audience, sound crew, everybody. I wonder how many of you here tonight are chosen to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles and to Israel, like Paul was. I wonder how many are in this place, you feel that, that unction to do something 
for God to speak to Gentiles and, and, and the Jews, Israel. If that's you, I would like for you to identify yourself by just standing up. If that's you. You feel led to, to tell people about the gospel of Jesus. It's not a bad thing if you don't stand. I'm, I'm not trying to single you out because there's, no, there's none of that here. We all have different purposes in this world. I was talking to a young man today on the phone. I, you can st sit down now. Thank you. <laughs> I was talking to a man today on the phone. He's, um, I really hope you would pray for this. He's a great friend of mine. How many Astros fans do we have? How many actually watch them? <laughs> Amen. Preach. I love the Astros too, but I haven't watched a game this year because we cut off our cable bill. And we cut our cable, so I just, I just don't watch it anymore. So every time you, the, the batter comes to the plate, just begin to pray for my friend. He's the guy that is in Minute Maid on the camera, and he's got the high and tight spot on the catcher, on the batter. He's in center field, and every time we get to go to the Minute Maid, we run up there and go see him, and he's running the camera. He's, hang on a second. Okay, what do I? Oh, wait. You know, because he can't miss that. His, uh, the network would not like that. But he lost his son about four or five months ago in a horrific car wreck. And I was talking to him today, and I said, he was asking me about attorneys and this, that, and the other, and what he should do because all kinds of situations going on. I said, I said, listen, you're going to have to follow your, your, your gut on that one. I, I can't tell you that. He said, should I ask them if they're Christians or this, that, and the other? I said, listen, I don't know. This is what I would say, though. We don't elect a president just because he's a, he's a Christian. We elected our past president, not the current president, the past president, because he was a businessman, because he was, had some fortitude to fight back against the, the groups and stuff like that. Anyway, I'm not getting political on this. I'm just, I'm using this as an example. I said, I didn't choose him because he was a Christian. I chose him because I felt like we needed somebody for the country. And I said, so you just choose somebody, you know, and I'm going on. So anyway, I say that to say this, you that stayed in your seats, you've got a calling that's outside the lines of ministry in some capacity. We all do, right? We all have something to do in this world. We all do. And it doesn't all involve ministry. There's priests and kings. And so we have to be willing to accept that ministry. That's our ministry. And we go. But I love the fact that people are called to the ministry. At some point during Pastor Gary's message last week, I wrote these words down in my notes. Paul knew he would suffer for the gospel. Our generation, and I really firmly believe that, our generation today, the church, is not ready or prepared for suffering for Christ or persecution. We're not prepared for that. We're not ready for that. We don't think of that. We think in terms of the rapture, getting out of here, and boom, it's all going to be good. And I am too, believe me, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm praying for the rapture tonight. So if you're not right with God, just pray right now because I'm praying for it to happen. But the thing about it is, is that, that the, whole, the whole idea of, of us, us fulfilling our calling or, or praying for the, the future or whatever, at some point, I really believe that the United States of America is going to suffer religious persecution at some point in the near future. I believe that. I, I, I hope it's, I hope we're okay when we go through it.
But you know that mostly the United States of America is one of the prime countries that doesn't have suffering already. There's a lot of persecution in other countries. And we don't live under the umbrella of an Americanized uh, gospel. We live under the gospel. We've been fortunate in our country. But I really believe that in days in the future, whether that's near or far, I don't know. I just feel that the United States of America is going to suffer in some capacity. And I want us to be ready. So Acts 20 verse 24 gives us Paul's main thought on finishing the race. This is what he wanted to do. And this is from, still from Pastor Gary. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. He said, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work. That race for us, anyone for that matter, would include teaching the good news in our own families. We might not be called to preach the gospel, teach a Bible school, uh, class, or teach anything in the church, but we are all called to teach and preach inside our own homes. That's our life right there. Amen? That's our life. I didn't always do the teaching thing and, the, and my responsibility right as my kids were growing up. But I can promise you one thing. Gayla and I did our very best to make sure Jesus was first and living for him was our highest priority, period. It was our highest priority to live for Jesus. And yes, that included raising and teaching our children. Pastor Gary said at the end of this message, how heartbreaking would it be to know we've led many people to heaven and looked back to realize that our kids weren't in that group. That statement put the fear of God in me in a new level. No one will do it perfect, but many will completely neglect to do it at all. Let me say that again. No one will do it perfect, right? No one will. We try to. But no one will teach their children, their family, perfectly. But there are many people that will completely neglect that responsibility 100%. Tonight, I want to talk to you about seasons of our life. Specifically, I want to talk about the wilderness journey. The wilderness, as Israel journeyed through the wilderness in the Old Testament. And I want to bring some examples of how that, that tour through the wilderness was much like what we have here in our own lives, in our own spiritual lives. See, the wilderness is what we will go through spiritually and even a physical wilderness at times. I've always taught that our, our goal in life is not necessarily a specific land or position. Our goal in life is to live in the image of Christ and live for him wholly and completely surrender to him so that we can, we can encounter or we can live and we can enter into what we call the fullness of Christ. Amen? Amen the fullness of Christ. That's my goal in life is to live in the fullness of Christ. That place of spiritual maturity, not spiritual perfection, that place of growth and clarity and wisdom and that's full of surrender to Christ. When you lose your attraction for the things of the world and your heart turns its attention completely towards Jesus. That's the fullness of Christ. So how does that relate to us and how does their journey, Israel's journey in the Old Testament, how does that relate to seasons or stages of our lives here spiritually? Number one, uh, we, we all came from a position of being unsaved or we didn't have relationships with Christ. Amen? 
and so did Israel. They came from that same position. They didn't start in Egypt. See, they were delivered from Egypt, but they didn't start there. They started as honored guests of Pharaoh as Joseph was second in command. They were invited to come over because Egypt was gonna take care of them. So the very same thing that I look at, I said, okay, so what is that? Where is that about us and the people today and Christians? I looked at it as we were, we were invited guests when we were born into this world as little children, innocent. We were cared for. We were taken care of. Our, our parents took care of us. They nurtured us. We were brought into this world. But we were unsaved in our beginnings of our, of our Christian life. As Israel was slaves in Egypt, to me, it's a picture of the unsaved. When we get to the position of our own choices and we begin to say, oh, wait a minute. I think I, think I like some of this stuff in Egypt. They actually... They actually wanted to be back in slavery. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but they wanted to actually be in slavery again. Let us go back to Egypt where we were in slavery, but we had food and clothing and this, that, and the other. We had our own little setup. and We were comfortable in that. So they were unsaved. Unsaved. I I look at that as, just like I mentioned, Egypt. Number two, we're then the next phase of the next season that we moved into is we became born again. To me, I look at that as the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, you might look at it a little bit differently at different stages of the game. Some preachers do and some don't. I, I, I'll just tell you what I believe and you can look at that picture and if it works for you, that's fine. If not, then you got to read the Bible. Amen, read it. Newly saved, crossing the Red Sea. Listen to this. Every believer, whether you ask Jesus into your heart at a very early age, how many of you did that? You asked Jesus into your heart really early? Amen. I asked Jesus into my heart when I was like six or seven years old. My dad told me exactly what I was supposed to say. I was in a Baptist church. He told me I was gonna go get water baptized and just give my life to Jesus. And Bingo, I was gonna be a Christian the rest of my life. So eventually I had a Red Sea crossing because that's what I needed, amen? That was the reality check for me. That was the point of truth for me at that moment. I'm not saying anything that that small children don't get saved early when they ask Jesus in their heart because I think we should continue to tell people, our kids, I, I, I pray my, my, I guarantee you my kids got saved every night. I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, anything bad, if they were chewing gum and I told them not to, let's repent and let's get right with God. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, but I'm, I'll tell you the truth, man, we were strict, and I was probably way too strict. But in that Red Sea crossing, every believer has it at some point. And whether you ask Jesus into your heart very early in life, baptized, and had everybody in attendance and had the certificate to... Back it up. I gave my life to Jesus and was water baptized when I was seven, eight, ten, whatever. I, it, it, whatever it happens. But every believer eventually crosses the Red Sea in their older life. It's the time when you have the world's army chasing you for your decision that you are making publicly that you want to leave that comfort of Egypt. And then ahead of you, you've got a physical impossibility ahead of you that only the Lord could bring you through safely. You've got the world yelling at you behind you. You've got the impossibilities in front of you. But you said, man, I'm going through. It's a Red Sea crossing for me. Man, the Lord's taken us to Canaan land. The Lord's taken me to the fullness of Christ. That's where I'm going. That's the way I understood it. That's the way I've been taught. That's the way I've taught people. You see, I, I, I know there were many times, you know, even like when the, the, the uh, Israel was in Egypt, you know, there was lots of confrontations with the Pharaoh. There was a lot of times that they were trying to get out of Egypt, right? They had leaders to pull us out of Egypt. I think there's a lot of times that the Spirit of God was working on you before you finally said yes. 
There were many times, but you said, yeah, yeah, no, no, not right now, not right now. And then he'd get your attention again. Yeah, yeah, what? Yeah, God, live for Jesus, go to church, read, read the Bible. Nah, not yet. You know, there were many times that that spirit of God was working on you, drawing you, pulling you. Because remember something, you cannot go to heaven unless the spirit of God draws you. You can't go on your terms and say, I, I, when I'm ready, I'll come get you, Jesus, and we'll do this little prayer thing and it'll all work out. It don't work out like that. No man comes to the Father lest the Spirit of God draws him. I believe before you had the Red Sea crossing, the Spirit of God was drawing you. I just believe that the Red Sea is when you finally said, enough is enough. I'm done with the world. And then the world starts clawing at you. Starts chasing you. That's what Pharaoh's army did. They didn't want any part of it. They were going across the Red Sea. The next phase is you've got your Christian growth phase. You've got this wilderness journey, and this wilderness journey is not pleasant. I call it, I call it the growing Christian. Sadly, victory comes with struggle, failure, challenges. Some you win and some you lose. Hard times bring growth. They bring trust. They bring eventually complete dependence on the Lord. I would like for it to be where I, I, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say, how many of you want to have some victory, man, this year? I'm, I've got a million dollars. I'm fixing to throw it up in the air. Y'all come and all get some. You come and run up there and grab your little handful and you're pop, putting in your pocket. You're putting everywhere you can go. You run out there, you'll be the same person you would when you first came in and tried to grab all that million dollars. You'd be just as miserable. Just as miserable. Hard times bring all these great changes in our life. It, unfortunate, it's like that. But this is where ministries, though, I believe, too, are born in the Christian growth phase and that wilderness journey. Ministries are born. Families and friends, though, are separated because of commitment at times. Changing values will change and move people apart. Some people together. New families are developed. The Bible becomes alive in your life. It becomes a living source of strength to the believer. This is the wilderness journey. It becomes the living source of strength to the believer. Transformation happens deep in this season. It's the, it's the season of pain. It, it hurts. The nation of Israel was going into the wilderness. God, listen, the Lord never intended to get them into the wilderness for 40 years. The trip from where they were coming out of Egypt to the Canaan land was really going to take them about a two-year journey. And they were journeyed through the wilderness for two years. And at the end of the second year is basically when they get to the Canaan land corner, or if you will, the, the, the boundary lines. And then it was up to them. What are you going to do now? You've, you've come this far. You've experienced some heartache. You've experienced some pain. You've experienced some, some really tough times coming in through out of, this, out of uh, uh, Egypt now through the wilderness and now to Canaan land. I've got something really awesome for you if you'll keep going. See, the wilderness becomes a living source of strength to the believe, uh, The Bible in the wilderness becomes a, a living source of strength. Transformation, as I mentioned, happens big. It's a place in time that you never want to uh, stay too long, the wilderness that is. But you also don't want to leave too quick. Israel's lasted eventually 40 years, so don't be in a hurry. If you feel like you're going through something today, it's probably because you're growing as a Christian. It's probably because things in your life are pretty fairly normal. If you feel like you're really growing in Christ, 
I'm talking about growing. I'm not talking about I'm, I'm, I'm learning, you know, how to, uh, okay, I've got my first discipline of prayer. I'm going to sit down, you know, our Father, which art in heaven, da, 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 da. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about some things are really starting to take root in your life. You're starting to push away from things that used to be an invitation for you that you didn't know how to quit. You didn't know how to give up. But things are starting to take root now. Why? Because you know that serving Jesus is the only way. See, I, I, my mission in, in life is, is really, uh, I'd love to, to be a discipler and this, that, and the other, but I'm going to tell you something. If I can just stir just one person to saying, man, I'm giving up all of this for my measly little life that I think is exciting, and all it's doing is it's destroying me. It's destroying my family. It's destroying my livelihood. It's destroying who I am. Why don't I just pay attention and go like you tell me you're, you want that I should go? So don't get in a hurry. Stay in the wilderness as long as it takes. And then the last season is really the older and more seasoned position of us as Christians, and that's where we are actually crossing the Jordan River. This is what the, the, where the fullness of Christ comes into play. The, the, the Jordan River is, is the crossing to the promised land. They crossed the Red Sea, then they had to cross the Jordan River into the promised land. This is the purpose of destination or destination for Israel and the new believer. The promised land is not just given it must be possessed fully. God's giving it to you, but it's not going to come just because you're a good little boy. You've got to take a, a hold of it. Nobody developed a prayer life by just saying, Lord, I hope you wake me up in the morning. Oh, man, Lord, oh, wake me up in the morning. I, I'm, I'm, ready to, I'm, ready to, I'm ready for some discipline. I'm going to pray every morning. Lord, wake me up in the morning. Staying up, 11 o'clock, Lord, oh, I better get to bed, Lord, but wake me up in the morning, Lord. No, see, the morning prayer time starts in the evening. You prepare to get up in the morning and pray and seek God. Amen. David said in Psalms 5, Lord, early in the morning, Lord, thou shalt hear my voice. You're not a morning person, find something else, but find that place. But we think that that's going to just happen naturally. And folks, I'm here to tell you, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to kick yourself in the tail to say, get up out of that bed right now. Some days I just want to get my, it's a, my phone. My phone, you know, we don't have alarm clocks anymore, right? We have our phones that sit by our bed. Some days I just want to go. Throw it somewhere. But I thank God that I've got a wife that gets up early too. That's always easy when both of you are involved. And it's not an everyday thing, okay? We don't get up at 4.45 or 5 o'clock every day. There's some days we like to sleep in. But listen to me. This season of this promised land season, it's got to be taken a hold of, possessed fo forcefully. This is the season that old things creep back sometimes even into your life because you never really took possession of the victory. And there are definitely new battles, as we all know, as one ages in the Lord and even our physical life. It's so important to understand the season you're in. Exodus 13, 17 through 18 that's Exodus 13, 17 through 18. Listen to what the word says. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. Why didn't he do that? Listen to this. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness towards the Red Sea. Thus, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. I think sometimes they probably got a little bit cocky. 
what was supposed to be a year to a two-year journey through this initial stage of the wilderness turned out to be a 40 years journey because of their unbelief and their lack of or their unwillingness to understand why God chose this way in the first place. It seems like we always have another plan for ourselves or think that we know better than God. We normally will choose the path of least resistance. After leaving Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, coming to the edge of the promised land now, the people begin to complain again right at the finish line. Man, they're, they're, they went through the two-year journey. They're at the deal. Remember, we're not, they haven't been turned back yet, so the 40 years hadn't started yet, right? They're in this two-year journey. It's, they've been through the wilderness. God's been providing food and shelter for them. And he, the Bible says that their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. God provided for them. That's how he does it, right? He provides for you. He gives us things. He blesses us in ways that we don't deserve it. And sometimes we don't recognize it, but he does it anyway because we become his children. That's how you clothe your own child. That's how you love your own child. Amen. And that's how God does with us. So they come to the edge of the promised land and they begin to fuss and, and, and complain about it. They traveled those two years. They saw the miracles. Listen to this. They saw miracles of deliverance. They saw the miracle of the Red Sea parting and not losing one person as they crossed over. They saw provision of food, as I mentioned, clothing. But to answer their complaining, Moses gets the people. You know the story if you've been in church a long time. If you haven't, I'm going to tell you a little bit, just briefly. He says, okay, you got 12 tribes. Give me a leader from every single tribe. I want those 12 people to go over into the land and find out if this is really worth it or not. This is what you're doing to somebody that's a new, per, a new, they're a new believer, or maybe it's somebody that's your job or whatever, and you're trying to convince them about serving God and how to get right with the Lord. And they're saying, yeah, but tell me about this or tell me about that. Or, you know, what do I have to read? Do I have to go to church all the time? Do I have to do this? Do I have to give up my drugs and alcohol, and sex and this, that, and the other? Do it, because man, brother, I don't want to do all that stuff. I mean, I just want, I want, I want God. I mean, I want your God. Cause I mean, like, you know, you wear him pretty well. I want him. But I don't want to do all that other stuff. So what we do is we get into this situation where we're starting to, we hear these, same thing happened with Egypt, I mean, Israel. They sent the 12 spies over and here they come back, you know, they've been over there for, you know, I think it was several, it was like a couple of months they were over there. I mean, they weren't going over there just, you know, checking out the fruit. They were, they were staying a long time. They were really trying to figure this thing out. And obviously, they're on foot too. So, you know, transportation was a little bit slower. But they, go into the, they go into the promised land. This is the promised land. They come back with a report. You know the deal. If you've been in church, that 10 of them came back and says, we cannot take this land. Listen to this. This is in, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 25. And exploring the land for 40 days, they were there, and men returned to, to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel and, the, and Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community that they had seen and showed them the fruit. Man, we got it. It, it is it, just like what they said, guys. There, man, there's some massive fruit up there. And I like grapes, and there's some big ones. There, this is a real stuff. I mean, here, look at this fruit. It says, verse 27, this was their report to Moses. We entered the land to, uh, that you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces, but the people, whoa, hang on a second, but the people, but the people, Living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak, the Amalekites live in the Gev and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. We cannot beat those guys up. You want us to go over there and try to get into a fight with these people? Caleb, 
I love Caleb. I love him and Joshua. But Caleb tried to quiet the people because he saw something going on here. He saw a coup fixing to happen right here. He said, man, we're fixing, this is not going to end well if I don't settle this thing down. He says, hey, listen, listen to what he says. Try to quiet the people. Hang on, guys. Y'all just be quiet for a second. Let's go now, right now. Before, they, before the word got spreading all through the camp that it's, it's lots of people, big guys over there, and we look like grasshoppers. He said, man, I got to quieten these people down. He said, we can do this. Let's go. Verse 30, we can conquer it. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with, with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the, the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. They get to the place of murmuring and complaining. But Steve, y'all can come. The Bible says in Numbers 14, 3, basically that the people were just tired. They're tired of fighting. They're tired of fighting. They were, and they've only been doing this now a couple of years. They crossed over the, uh, the, the Red Sea. They're looking into the, into the promised land and, and they're thinking, just show me something a little bit easier. Show me something a little bit easier. This is what we do in our own life, right? I mean, uh, it, you might be lying if you said, I, I'd like life just a little bit easier sometimes. Because life is tough. You know why it's tough? Because this world is broken. This world is broken. The only stable thing in this world is things to do with Jesus. Amen. That's the only stable thing there is in in this whole world right now is things to do with Jesus. Maybe you're here tonight. You're tired of fighting. Maybe you're just, you're, you're struggling. You're saying, man, look, I might've been one of the people that murmured and complained because this Christian thing is not what people told me it was gonna be. I don't know why you got saved. I don't know why you gave your life to Jesus. I don't know what the the I don't know what that that relationship was. I don't know what that encounter was like with you. I can only I can only look inside myself and know how that all went down with myself. And it was it was a little bit of a time span. I, I mean, I got arrested three times, and finally, I just said, "What am I doing?" What am I doing? I just got fed up. I didn't wait for anybody at that jail cell. I knelt down in that jail cell that night on that third time of being arrested. I said, God, I am I am lost. I have no hope in my life. I have nothing going right. I just want you. I just want you. I just want you. And folks, this is, this is all, this is all I care about. This is all I care to, to communicate to you is he's all, you need it's all you need sometimes he becomes the last person we choose try to figure life out and do our own thing with it until it just becomes frustrated wall we keep bumping into the battle for you It's become overwhelming sometimes. I'm here to tell you, after serving God now since 1979, the battle for me gets overwhelming too. Sometimes I just say, man, 
When is this all gonna stop? God, do you really hear us? Because we really need help right now. I'm here to tell you tonight if that's you. I'm here to encourage you, to tell you that the finish line is just ahead. It's just ahead. You have to keep fighting. You can't quit. You have to keep fighting. You didn't start this race to experiment how it would feel to walk with Jesus. If you gave your life for the right reasons, you gave your life because he was the only thing that could get you any peace of mind, any comfort, any love, any joy. He's the only one. And he met you right there. I'm not going to tell you that staying in the race is not going to hurt at times because it is. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. You're going to hurt. You're going to cry. You may lose friends and you might even lose family. And many of the same struggles that you now have, you may have in the future. Unless the Lord chooses to heal you and provide miracles in your life. And I'm going to promise you something. I promise you something. I will be the first one to gain, to, to go in agreement with you for those miracles. I will pray with you for miracles. Because the Bible says signs and wonders follow us that believe. And ever so often, I get a little weird sometimes. I know, I know. And I'll just look behind me and say, Lord, I need miracles. I need miracles. You said they would follow me. So I'll be the first one to pray for that miracle for you. Acts 20, 24. But my life, again, is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And finally, for the Apostle Paul, that work was to tell the people about the grace of God. I don't know what the finished work is for you. I don't know what God has called you to. I can only answer for myself. But I know that he is calling each one of you to finish strong and experience victory in the wilderness. victory. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. We, we heard the song tonight, Jesus is our champion. We don't follow losers. Look, I don't know who's all here tonight that's 
Maybe something dropped off the plate tonight to, into your lap and you said, wow, I need that right now. I needed that right now. There's something that you want us to pray with you about tonight or want me to pray with you about. I just want you to, maybe it's, maybe it's just your own personal life. Maybe you're just needing some time just to say, wait a minute, I just need, I just need to go back because I've been the one complaining. I've been the one complaining. I'm coming out, crossed over Egypt. I've crossed over the Red Sea. I've seen the miracles, Brother David, but I complain, I complain, I complain. And if it gets any harder, if it gets any tougher, if persecution really comes our way, I'm not ready for it. And how do you get ready? You don't, you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of guns and all this kind of stuff. You should already have those. <laughs> Scratch that. I'm telling you, Jesus is your answer. You know that. He's your answer. He's your answer. Let's stand. <laughs> I don't know what you need here tonight. If you want to just come and pray and kneel down at this altar, if you need somebody to pray with you, I'll pray with you. I'm going to pray for your miracle, for miracles to happen for you. Maybe you're going through a hard time and you're the one complaining. You're the one saying, man, man, man. It was, it was more fun in the world. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have some fun in the world. But it was all empty fun. Amen? It was all empty. It didn't take me nowhere except drinking, drugs, alcohol. You've heard my story about abortion. He is our answer. He is our answer. So if you need to come and pray, just find a place to pray. If you need me to pray for you, just come and stand up here and we'll begin to pray. Man, let me just pray over this congregation. Lord, oh man. We love you so much. Lord, you've been good to us. You've been a good, good, good father. You've been really good. I just pray, Lord, the Spirit of God will claw deep tonight. Touch people's lives right where they are. We just want you, God. There's no secret formula to that. There's no religious line that I can give them and get them to quote and take it home with them. It's Lord, you're here and we just need you. And you're here to pour yourself out upon us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Good night. Good night, everybody. I need you more More than yesterday I need you more Lord, more than words can say 
I need you more 